So tonight I want to throw out some ideas. And then I'm going to do about 30 minutes and, and then I'm going to stop. And let's, I used to run a group called the Software Roundtable at the MTBC. And we would talk on a topic for about 30 minutes. And then we'd encourage a, a robust discussion if there was people that wanted to say things and, and give their ideas about what uh, we were talking about earlier. Um, and if we, if we don't have any idea, we don't want to talk that much, and I'll finish my presentation. But uh, I want to throw out some ideas here to start with and uh, kind of uh, kick off the meeting then. So as everybody knows, um, uh, the, well, my agenda is I'm going to talk a little bit about the history. As Yasser said a while ago, this has been around for many, many years. And I've been involved in it for over 25 years as well. And it was very archaic when we first got started. And I kind of break it down. It's a very co the Internet of Things can be a very complex architecture and topic. I kind of break it down into three areas. Devices, wireless networks, and IoT, the back end of all the systems that it would take to, to uh, make it possible. And then if we've got time, I'll talk about the uh, network effect and uh, the platform uh, effect as well. So uh, all these, obs all these uh, observations I make are my own, my personal. Uh, I'm not representing BlackBerry. I have to make this very clear because BlackBerry is two sides of the company right now. And, uh, I'm not allowed to play on the IoT side. So I, uh, I'm not representing them at all. So as Yasser has talked about uh, SCADA, supervisory control of data acquisition, telemetry, and industrial automation were some of the terms that was used 25 uh, more years ago uh, to describe what we now call uh, Internet of Things or machine-to-machine -machine communications. And they used technologies like wireline and microwave and private radio. My system was a private radio system talking to a mainframe. So it was very archaic. No microprocessors on the remote sites. Uh, and then satellite uh, has possibilities and has been used there uh, uh, in its cases. Now this is a linear chart of how the machine to machine and the internet of things has become more sophisticated. We start off with RFIDs and some pretty uh, rudimentary technologies and then we keep progressing. But this is a linear chart. In actuality, we're in exponential times. So and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. What's going to happen here is that every two years, we're writing this Moore's Law, the computational curve, and incredible things are going to be possible in a few years that are not even possible now. So the, um, the ecosystem is very complex. There's, it's very chaotic. There's lots of people doing things. But the exciting thing is there's a lot of talent, knowledge, and ideas that are in this uh, ecosystem. And we're going to see some incredible solutions come out of this and new Googles and new Facebooks and, and uh, new companies uh, rise out of this chaos uh, to run the world. And as we all probably know, the Internet of Things is about connecting remote objects and controlling them if we, if we need to or want to. What we're adding with the Internet of Things is intelligence to the remote sites and to the back end and how we deal with these devices. And because of the economics, power going up, the cost going down, we're going to be able to tag and monitor and control objects that in the past were not feasible. It was too costly to do that. Now it's going to be very easy to, to tag those things, monitor them, and even control them in a lot of cases. Uh, so new possibilities are going to happen. One of the things is the Internet of Things is going to become the nervous system of the world. We're going to be able to do things that we weren't possible to do and make our electrical systems, our transportation systems, our supply chains much more e uh, uh, efficient and be able to fight our wars and protect ourselves in a whole different way. So there's lots of good things that come out. There's going to be some bad things. I choose to, my wife's always worried about that. I choose to look at the good that we can do this and let's hope that we can find ways to negate and handle the bad that's going to come out of this. If we have time, we can talk a little bit about security and privacy and all of that later on. So I found this slide, I thought it was very interesting. I think of the Internet of Things and, and I just put it through all together. But these guys, uh, Simtech, um, put together the idea that there are communication devices, our smartphones and tablets and things that we have right now, and we'll be using those as a small part of the Internet of Things, it turns out. And then you've got cellular. Cellular's been around now for 30 years almost, and uh, it's one of the first things you think about. But cellular has a lot of issues, power and cost and all. And then the other part that really was fun to me was the Internet of Objects, IOO. That subset is actually going to be the one that's going to explode. And I'll show you in a moment, a moment in a few minutes more, what's going to enable that explosion and be able to handle that kind of thing. So all these different subsets come together for a superset called the Internet of Things. Now, the Internet of Things and uh, what's about to happen is going to be uh, an inflection point. 
Andy Groves talked about this when he ran uh, Intel many years ago and wrote a book. And he went back and looked at, at what happened with Intel and, and, and history and whatnot. And he realizes there are times in the world when business, the way business is run, the way that the, the technology that's available changes the way things are done significantly. And we've gone through those. When Jack Kilby and, and uh, Robert Noyce created the Internet of Circuit back in 1958, they set us on the Moore's curve at that point, where every two years we're doubling in the, horse, in the horsepower, the capabilities of the computing uh, platforms that we have out there. And then in 84, the Bell operating system was a monopoly. Before that, it choked any innovation. I lived through that. Dell telephone was, was, it was it. You picked up the phone and called, that was nothing. When they broke that up, we started to see innovative ideas start coming to market. What we have now with the cellular with the internet, of things and cellular networks, and these different technologies we have available, all became possible after the 84. And of course, the early 80s were the personal computers. The 90s was the internet made, made available to the masses. And then Steve Jobs changed the world forever with his smartphone. I almost killed Blackberry. But that's another story. So um, that exponential curve I talked about, we're going to see. Right now, we just got a handful of devices compared to what's going to happen. By 2020, many analysts, several analysts, are saying we'll have 50 billion devices connected. We may or may not. It may be a year or two later. But the idea is we're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of devices that we're going to monitor and control in the future. Now, I talked about what we'll go. My, my new hero was Peter Diamantes. He started the XPRIZE Foundation and Singular University. The idea of the Singular University is to train business people to create companies that will have a positive effect on a billion people in a decade. A very progressive idea, but some pretty awesome things that are coming out of that Singular University. It was created about two years ago or so. But when, they, when he talks, he's on TED, so if you ever go to TED and do Peter Diamantes, you'll see uh, his idea of abundance. The future is abundant or something like that. He talks about the six Ds of exponential technology. You first start off with digitizing the world. So everything is, is being digitized, and that's the beginning of that is very deceptive. It's, it's because when you're doubling at 0 0.01, and you got 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.08, you're still in point <coughs> ohs. It doesn't look like, like much uh, impact. But at a certain point, when you keep doubling like that, then you get to a very disruptive stage, and suddenly the power and the capabilities you have change the way things are done. So then you can start dematerializing what has been very um, asset intensive in the past. You demonetize it, you take out all the costs that are, it takes to run a, an operation or uh, an approach to things, and then you democratize it so that many people can get involved in it and not just have one supplier on a monopoly kind of thing. So the idea of exponential technology is what's driving this uh, uh, Internet of Things. So we're going to see incredible uh, ideas come out. And you guys are the ones that are going to help create some of those ideas. So uh, it's an open playground right now to be thinking about how can you utilize these technologies. So we'll see in a moment there are several different analysts that are looking at cellular as a place and the low, uh, the short range um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and short-range device frequencies and technologies have a place. But there's a thing called Low Power Wide Area Networks, LP WANs, and they're going to do 50 to 80% of all of the connections that are going to take place over the next few years. And that's pretty uh, impressive because that's a lot of devices we have to start communicating with. So when I, when I started realizing all the data we'd be collecting, we all know about kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and even petabytes. We're about to start collecting so much data that we start getting into exabytes, zettabytes, and I had to look it up. I didn't know what they were. So exabytes, zettabytes, and yodabytes is going to be possible in the next few, in the few two years or at least within the decade. The architecture for the Internet of Things is very complex, so I break it down. I like to look at it kind of as three things. There's devices, there's the networks, the wireless typically for connecting all this stuff, and then you've got all your back-end stuff. Each one of those are very complex and very deep in the technologies and what you need to know to make those things successful. But I'm going to focus on the first two right now, and if we don't have a robust uh, uh, debate or talk afterwards, then I'll talk about the third one, the back-end. So devices, as Yasser was saying earlier, 25 years ago were very simple. They were hardware. There was no microprocessor or memory or operating system or applications on those devices. They were strictly the mainframe or whatever device that was back at the home sent out a command and you could turn something on and turn something off and you read maybe something. If you got an analog signal, that was very special. So very, very rudimentary in its capabilities. And 
Since that time, there are new devices that evolved into, we've got sensors and actuators in the remote site. They're controlled by microprocessors. The more memory you add, the more sophisticated the applications, the more intelligence you add to that remote site, things you can do. Then the way it talks to the world, and either it can do a lot of stuff on its own and it should report back, or it can go back to the home base and, and ask for instructions as to how it can handle the situation. So those are the kind of things that the new devices can do. And of course, all that's based on the operating system. So you've got a whole bunch of different types of companies supporting the devices out there. So you've got QNX, which is a hard real-time operating system, as, as, as is Wind River, Linux Works, and Green Hills um, software. And then you've got people that have less robust, hard, real-time operating systems. They're just uh, real-time or just regular operating systems. Depending on your needs, you can uh, use those to create your devices. And then you've got the people that are actually using all these different parts of the technology to create the devices themselves. So a very robust ecosystem for the devices. The essence is that these devices are going to become ubiquitous. Um, they're going to be everywhere. They're going to be very intelligent, very small, very economical. But the key is they're going to be like dust. They're going to, you won't even know they're there a lot of times. And, and that's good and that's bad. It's going to be kind of scary. And all the things are going to be able to be monitored and controlled in the future. So the thing that I really want to talk about tonight uh, is my heart, my, what I really enjoy. And that's the, the wireless networks. So in the past, we've had wireline and microwave and private radio. And then cellular came on the scene, and 2G is not a bad network for doing Internet of Things. However, 3G and, and LTE and 4G and 5G, they're about helping smartphones and high data transmissions take place. Not the machine-to-machine -machine, Internet of Things type of transmission. Right. Short packets, small payloads <coughs> need to be transmitted, a lot of upload from the remote sites, a little bit of download kind of thing. That's not what 3G, 4G, and LTE and, and 5G is all about. So cellular is on a different path, but they are trying to do something, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. And then, of course, you've got the short-range technologies. Wi-Fi, uh, wi Mesh, Zigbee, uh, Z-Wave, there's several other, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, they're short-range device technologies and frequencies that are used. And then you've got satellite. It has its place, expensive, doesn't penetrate well, but it, it's good for backhaul in some cases where you've got really, really remote sites. Uh, the problems with cellular, of course, is that it's, they're, they're trying to handle high data trans transfers and your smartphones and things. They're not focused on the machine to machine uh, for most of their business. That, that's changing because they got a lot of, they realize they're going to miss a lot of business if they don't come up with a way to handle the kind of requirements that machine to machine requires. But right now they're, they're not only expensive to create, they're expensive in their overhead, high overhead, and expensive in the power that they use. So you can't run them off batteries for very long. And then you got your short range technologies creating a large network of short-range systems and managing all that is a real problem. So it has its uh, place, but it probably won't be the technology that's, that's best suited for a wide area. Private radio and microwave are possible for some applications, but again, not ubiquitous and, and good for everything. And satellite has its problems with cost and coverage and penetration. Now, low-power winds is what I'm going to talk about a bit more here. New idea. Take the ability uh, to send signals that are very low power over unlicensed frequencies. So the frequencies are free. Cellular carriers have to pay billions of dollars for the frequencies they have dedicated to their use. But there's frequency bands, uh, particularly at below a gigahertz. In the radio world, anything below a gigahertz has good range for low power and good penetration capabilities. And the lower you go, the better you are. But anything below a gig is, is good to work with. So low power winds take advantage of some of these available frequencies uh, below my gigahertz. Now, the characteristic of a low power wind system is that it's low power in its transmissions, long range relative to the power, and we're talking about three to six miles typically uh, for most urban and suburban environments, even further than that in a rural area. But we're talking about mostly, uh, a lot of times, rural, uh, suburban and urban areas, you want to be able to talk deep into buildings, and that's what below gigahertz helps you do with some tricks that they use. And I'll talk about that more so in a moment. But you need to have for the devices the ability to be low power in its consumption. And the goal is to be able to put a, a transmitter and processor on a device and a battery and let it run for over 10 years. Never touch it again. If you can reach that goal, 
now it becomes very possible to create solutions that people don't have to touch for 10 years, take advantage of putting this stuff in remote sites and deep into places and in rugged areas where you don't want to go on a regular basis. Uh, so it opens up a lot of possibilities. You don't need high data rates. We're not talking about smartphones, we're not transmitting video or anything like that. We just need to send status, we need to send a emergency situation, uh, small payloads of information maybe about reading uh, that's taken periodically. So for those applications, low power WAN is a perfect kind of fit. And then you need to have a, the deep in building kind of penetration, vaults um, and basements and things where, people, where equipment is located, you can't normally get to, you want to be able to reach that. Low power WANs will be able to do that. And because they're using unlicensed frequencies, the cost for putting in a network is very low. You're not spending billions of dollars on the frequency, uh, you're spending it on the hardware. And the hardware is turning out to be pretty inexpensive because of the approach they've taken to make everything inexpensive to begin with, low overhead and low cost. Uh, and of course, the technology is adaptable to dedicated frequencies, so the cellular industry may wind up doing that too. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit that more in a moment, but uh, they're open to that. So you talk to different analysts, and they say, well, the short range systems will probably have 35% of the share of market, SOM. The cellular networks will probably have 10%, which is surprising, but cellular, because it has to be tied to something that has a very solid power supply, a car, this battery, an engine, or something that's on the electrical mains uh, in your, system, in your uh, city, they could work with cellular, work fine, but uh, the overhead and the cost for cellular is very pretty, it's pretty substantial. But low power wireless area networks will have anywhere from 55 to 80 percent, depending on who you talk to, share of market. So it's going to be a tremendous growth that we're going to see here in the near future. Machina research, if you ever have a chance to read some of their, their documentation, do it, because they, they do a very good job of, of doing research and understanding of what's going on uh, in the wireless world. So uh, I always like to keep up with the uh, reports that they come out with. They're saying that 50% of all Internet of Things applications will require only short bytes of data uh, to support these devices that are in the field. And latency is okay. It doesn't need to be real time. There, there can be some delay here for these uh, type, of, type of applications that they're identifying. And of course, they, need, they say the long battery life and in building penetration uh, is some of the key parts of, of uh, low power WANs that uh, are coming out there. And uh, these guys agree, they say 8% of those applications, low power WANs, would be a good fit for them. Uh, you need to have the batteries and need to be going into harsh uh, environments, outdoors, or deep into vaults and kind of things. Low cost communications, infrastructure, technology, we robust because it's going <laughs> to, it turns out these unlicensed frequencies are very harsh environments because they're unlicensed and allow anybody to transmit on them if they meet certain rules, but the transmissions are, are a real mishmash. So you've got to come up with a technology, a radio transmission protocol that's very robust and interference, can re reject interference and live in an interference world out there. And you'll see what it can do in a moment. You need to be able to move these devices around in some cases so the system needs to be able to support that kind of movement. It can't be just in one place all the time in some cases. And it needs to be highly scalable because we're talking about 50 billion devices off of one cell site. You either have you'll have a need for either 50,000 to a million devices to be supported by that device, and it's possible so with some of these technologies. Now the low power winds also uh, there's several different uh, technologies and frequencies and things that you can use. So it's a horse race right now. It's a wild west in the low power wind world. So the waitlist group, which I got started with well, two years ago, I read about their waitlist W protocol, an open protocol. If you, if you join the group just to help support the group, then you have access to their, their standard. And at that time, it was called W. It was white space. And it's talking about using the TV white spaces that are unused in the city. So if we're transmitting on 21 and 23 here in town, 22 is open, and that's a white space frequency available for this technology. The problem is it's allowed in the United States it's allowed in the UK, but that's it. Most of the rest of the world has said, no, we're not going to open up our TV frequency. The broadcasters have a little stranglehold on most governments. And so they're not opening them up to allow this protocol to be used. So the waitlist group stepped back and said, okay, what else can we do? There's ISM bands in the 868 band in Europe and 902 to 928 here in the United States that are low frequency, or are low power, the low gigahertz, uh, that are unlicensed. So they came up with a waitlist in protocol 
narrow band, ultra narrow band is what it actually stands for, to use those frequencies. Another company called LoRa, uh, Symtech actually came out with a protocol called LoRa, long range WAN, or long range protocol, LoRa, uh, which is very similar uh, in its approach in that it uses the unlicensed frequencies. It's fed spectrum, so the military uses it, it's very good at dealing with interference and whatnot. So that's their approach. So Weightless said, okay, we need to come up with something else, and they recently announced that they're going to come out with P, Weightless P, and it stands for uh, performance. It's based on a set of protocols that a company called M Squared Communications is donating to the SIG, the Weightless SIG that's working on this open protocol, open uh, standard, and they're going to take the ideas of this uh, M Squared uh, Communications group and add to it the technologies and the protocol stacks that they already created for Weightless W, which is very robust and very powerful. Uh, adaptive data rates, adaptive power control, adaptive coding schemes, those kinds of things we added to P. So you're going to see a horse race here between Weightless P, people that adopt that protocol and put it into hardware first of 2016. So they're going to finish the protocol standard at the end of this year. So they have a different approach. I'll talk about that more in a moment. LoRa is already out there. It's a pr uh, proprietary protocol. Uh, LoRa, uh, Symtech has put it out there. If you use their chips, then you can have access to the protocol. So it's not open. Uh, if you're part of the ecosystem, and they've got a very powerful, a very uh, healthy ecosystem out there, so they're getting some traction in the marketplace with their special spectrum idea uh, going forward. The other company to watch, it's a three, three horse race, is Sigfox. They've got a narrow, what they call ultra narrow bound technology that is not very good. It's one way for the most part. Uh, there's questions about its effectiveness and reliability, uh, but they've got a big head start. They go to countries and they find people that are already involved in the radio network, the infrastructure there, typically uh, cell site owners or tower owners. And they say, look, we've got this technology, we want to put it out there. You're welcome to run it, use our technology to be able to monitor and control things. Uh, and they're getting a lot of buy-in. So they've got networks uh, throughout all of Europe, Russia, uh, Germany, and they're putting one in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area out there. But there's a lot of questions about its, its effectiveness and reliability. So watch them. They've got a head start. If they improve their technology, which they're, they're working on it, they, they might be a, uh, the other horse to watch here. Uh, TV wise space cellular. So the cellular guys realize that their path for 3G, 4G, uh, 5G is on a high data bandwidth, and they're missing opportunities down here for low power machine to machine, Internet of Things kind of capabilities. So they're going to come out with what they call machine type communications, MTC. Their, their 3G PP standards body represents the whole world. So it takes a long time for this group to come together and agree on anything. What they come up with will be a camel, we're, we're figuring. But that release three, or release 13, will come out in like 2017, and, and product will be out in 2018. So, and then it may not necessarily fulfill the requirements of a true low power WAN network. So, we'll have to wait and see. They're behind the curve, that's not their focus. <coughs> committee, designed by committee. So, God help them. <laughs> now, there's a wild card in all of this thing, which is fun. Radio guys that are hardcore say there's no way in heck it's going to work. This guy, Steve Perlman, created QuickTime for Apple many years ago. He several, started several other companies, took his amassed fortunes, and for the last 10 years he's been working on this technology he calls P-Cell, P-Wave, with a company he's named Artemis. So if you go do a search on P-Cell, you'll find some very interesting things. I'll talk about that more in a moment. The idea is that he dedicates a data center, he drives tower sites, uh, antennas on these tower sites, and he sends signals that collide and interfere with each other. But in his technology and theory, where the, inter the signals interfere with each other, they create a cell site that transfer high data rates to that one little cell, a millimeter sized cell around the antenna. How fascinating idea, his demonstrations, if you do a, a search, he's done a demonstration in Columbia University in the East Coast and Stanford. Stanford's more fun. Go look at the Stanford one that he did late last year, and you'll be blown away with what the potential of what he's doing is if it's real. There's a lot of questions about 
what's behind the curtain. And he's saying that he's he's already rent, rent, he's uh, leased space from Dish Dish uh, TV, and Dish has got the approval to do land mobile communications over the frequencies that Dish has. He's going to rent at least space, about 10 megahertz of space there in the San Francisco area put in the system. It was supposed to put it in earlier this year and it hasn't done it yet. So there may be some problems with it. But it's fun to think that if he comes out with that, it will revolutionize radio communications. Um, so as I said, I'm going to go away. So TV white space. It, um, so these are frequencies that are available below gigahertz. Uh, the 902 and the 868 are what we call ISM bands, uh, industrial, scientific, and medical bands. have been used for many years. Lots of people on those frequencies. And that's what Sigfox, LoRa uh, are, are going after. Uh, but then the Weightless P group, that, that M squared communications group, has realized that if they use ultra narrow band, 12.5 kilohertz frequencies, then and that's very narrow stuff that they can do frequency hopping in FDM and TDM. They got all these different technologies that they're employing with this ultra band, ultra narrow band uh, approach. They can go access unlicensed frequency at 169, which is an awesome low power goes long way, penetrates deep. 433, 470 to 510, and I used to work in the UHF band 475, 10. Great frequencies for a lot of these applications. Uh, and then uh, the 780 frequencies and then the, uh, the other ones. So if their technology works out to be as good as it sounds on paper, they're going to be a very a force to reckon with uh, to, to, against LoRa. Uh, you'll have those two choices of how to build networks. And of course, the, we also have these 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz frequencies, short range the problem with those. They don't penetrate very well. But they will be used for some applications for uh, the Internet of Things. And then the cellular frequencies with their MTC, machine type communications, uh, they may uh, come up with a, a good idea and be able to have a significant part of the market, market share. We'll see how that works out. But all of this interest in the Internet of Things is driving the FCC and the British version of the FCC, what we call Ofcom. They're under great pressure to find more unlicensed frequencies, low power to make available uh, to these technologies. So there may be some dedicated frequencies opened up uh, for the Internet of Things with these low power restrictions put to it. So now I'm going to wrap it up here in a moment. These are the two technologies I'm talking about. So the weightless P is based on the M squared communications group technology called plant platinus. That's actually a tree. When I looked it up on the internet, it was a, a, a bunch of tree, a type of trees that are out there. So uh, they're going to take the basic ideas of platinus. The SIG group is going to add the protocol stack and other technologies that they've developed for weightless W uh, and weightless N possibly to the, the P protocol and finish it by the end of 20, 2015 and product will be available in 2016. Um, it's ultra low power when you put it in a sleep mode. It's less than uh, 10 uh, microamps. Uh, adaptive uh, power, adaptive data rates, adaptive coding schemes. When you, have, when you change your coding scheme, so to reach deep into buildings and in uh, vaults and basements and things, if you start off with one coding scheme at a, at a certain rate, and this is acknowledgement, it's two-way. If you don't get an acknowledgement with the W and with the P system, the base will say, or controller will say, I need to change the coding scheme and strength, uh, lengthen the signal. The longer the signal, the lower, longer time that it has to transmit, the more likely he's going to get into that vault or deep into the, into the, the basement or whatever. And he keeps changing. There was a, in the W, there's like 16 different protocols that keep getting longer to transmit, but they have more effective penetrating power. And, until you, and you keep changing until you find the one that reaches that particular site. And then you get an acknowledgement back, you get the information back, and then you move on. And so it's, it's lots of robust uh, variables that you can employ here to make your system reliable and uh, work uh, depending on what your situation is. Uh, and it can handle 50,000 in this particular first scale. The W system can handle a million devices in that white space frequency uh, in their protocol. So when they start combining these things, we may see that number go up significantly. And then uh, reliability, like I'm talking about. Uh, they're using all the different kind of radio technologies and this ACT-NAC uh, and then the coding, changing the coding schemes to make it possible. The other contender is the Symtec 
low Roth, long range WAN or long range internet, long range uh, low Roth Alliance is the group of the, that they have that's supp supporting and sponsoring uh, this uh, protocol. So it also says that it'll last for 10 years on a battery. It'll go about 10 miles in open space. Um, when you start looking at the details, they're like the WRP. Uh, they'll go two to three miles when you're trying to get into an urban area and deep into buildings. Uh, there'll be ADS two, uh, 128. Uh, P will be 128 or 256, depending on what you want to do. And it can handle many, many, many devices. So those are the two major horses uh, in the race here for low power WAN uh, capabilities. Uh, the other one, of course, is Sigfox, like I was saying. They got a head start, but their technology is weak. They might get better. Uh, they might be able to take off. Uh, N-Wave uses the weightless N technology. They actually, like the M squared com, N-Wave donated their technology they've been developing over the years, which became the weightless N protocol. Uh, it is one way also. So they're trying to improve it and make it two way. It may work out. I think P is the real uh, powerful one that's going to come up. M Square Communications donated their uh, protocols, so it would be the basis on which the uh, Weightless P is created. Newell was early on in the Weightless SIG development. They were bought by Huawei late last year, early this year. Uh, don't know what they're going to do. Newell was focusing on the cellular industry, so the cellular industry may work on their standard, but they may adopt some ad hoc uh, fill the gap type technologies until their standard comes out uh, to try to capture this business before they lose it to these uh, low power WAN systems and other, other approaches. And then there's other companies out there. OnRamp has a, a very nice uh, base of cu customers in the utility industry. So they got a niche. Their, their OnRamp, uh, their total reach technology is pretty pretty good uh, based on what I've understood. But they, they're not trying to, they're not thinking about the world. They're thinking about the United States. So utilities is what they're going to focus on. And then you have entrepreneurs and startups, things are going on behind the scenes that we don't know about, they're going to pop up. So we all need to keep our eyes and open, ears open to see what's going to be possible, uh, what's going to come out of the garages in the near future. Uh, and then the, the carriers have got their 3GPP, the, the MTBC protocol, or they may adopt some of these other technologies too. They've got the tower sites, they've got the backhaul, they've got all the infrastructure to support a low power wind network or any kind of Internet of Things network. It's just a matter of, do they want to go away from their standards to be able to implement something maybe on a short-term range? I bet they will. I bet there will be certain ones of them that will take that on right now, capture the business they can for the moment, and look at transferring them in three to five years when their, their standard becomes available, if it makes sense. We'll see. Uh, last two slides. The narrowband technology, like P, is 12.5 kilohertz. So you're putting all your energy on a spike, but you're, in the case of P, you're doing frequency hopping so that you it minimize your interference uh, so it's not all just you're not with spread spectrum and, and frequency hopping you have a chance to get the signal through even though you might be blasted on one particular channel or not. The low rod guys they go over this is typically a 200 megahertz channel uh, for them and they spread their signal like the military does with their spread spectrum uh, over that area so it by nature is resistant to interference uh, and has, because it's below the noise floor, it tends not to affect other systems. So that's a very interesting approach. We'll have to see how, the real, how it works in the real world, which one of these is actually the better approach, or they may be just as good depending on what the application is that uh, you need to use them for. Um, uh, and the adaptive uh, data rate that we're talking about, adaptive power rate, what that does for you, if you had to transmit a high power all the time from one of these sites, that, uh, one of these sites here, you would overwhelm all the short range sites if you blast it out. So with adaptive coding and adaptive power, you can change your power to be just what you need for that short distance, but you can uh, ratchet up your data rate so that you can transmit high, uh, lots of data if you need to for the short range, short range situations. But for your longer range, you can uh, adjust your power up as high as you need to and back down your data rate so that you can get through either that long distance or deep into to something else. So that's how the adaptive technologies that they're using uh, can help make these robust approaches to the fields. Last slide, uh, this is the uh, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Perlman, P-Cell, the Artemis thing. Uh, just do a Google search on P-Cell and then go look at the Stanford one and you'll be blown away with what he's showing that's possible. 
and if it, if it can be, um, it will change uh, radio communications. It'll make a lot of people very uh, eat their words. I have to eat a lot of a lot of crow. So that's it. The rest of my presentation is about the back end, uh, and we can talk about it some of the time. So I wanted to open it up to you guys and, and see if I hit a chord. If there's anything that you guys want to talk about or add to it, or uh, a question. Yeah. So. Um, how about crowding of these frequencies? So it is like the uh, problem of a commoner, right? So it's a public asset, these frequencies. And then, you know, there can be hackers who are just crowding out the frequencies. Or more as more and more people, if let's say if LoRa becomes successful, that means more devices get on the same frequency and then it becomes a problem. Yeah, what you have is your noise floor starts going up. So, ah. So when your noise floor starts going up, then you start losing your sensitivity in your receivers. So you'll have the problem, you either have to raise your power to be able to overcome them, right. uh, or uh, you'll have to go to a frequency. Yeah. There may be other ways to handle that, but... See, if I'm a farmer, right, and I invested whatever, $250,000 on building this infrastructure, and then five years later, a bunch of kids have started some things around my area, and then I have to just do whatever I did. So what guarantees that my investment is protected if I use this? You, just like anything, you're betting on the technology. Mm -hmm. And the reason why P and Laura may succeed mm -hmm. is because the technologies are very robust, utilizing many different techniques mm -hmm. to overcome the very thing you're talking about, the crowding of, of that. Now at a certain point, there may be no matter what you do technologically, you may have overwhelmed in major cities. Uh, or major, major areas where you've got so many systems. Like Wi-Fi right now, when you walk into this building, I bet you can find 20 different uh, Wi-Fi systems. Right. Yet your system will work, it just slows down. Right. So that's the beauty of the internet, of uh, low power WAN. The applications are for systems that are not real time. They don't need uh, quick response. So latency is okay. So that, that may be acceptable for a long period of time before it becomes unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And hopefully by that time then, the FCC, the uh, Ofcom, and, and many com companies around the world, particularly in the United States and Britain and Europe, they're trying to find other frequencies they can open up to allow this. So when you start opening up, and that's what's exciting about the 169 and, and 433 and 475.12, that's a lot of, 475.12 is a lot of frequency of, uh, offsets that are in there and, and spread the load, spread the impact. That's, those are very good concerns. Uh, that you would have as a business person you know, trying to implement this right. technology.